Good evening, everyone. So this week we'll be continuing our lectures on uh, STI topics, and this Saturday we'll be discussing primary syphilis. Now, syphilis is a very important topic, and it's actually uh, one of the most not one of the most. It is the most important STI that a postgraduate should know about in detail. So because of that, I decided to split it into multiple lectures. We'll be discussing each and every aspect of syphilis uh, separately in detailed video. And uh, there is a very high chance that this particular video would be quite long because I would like to complete the whole entire primary syphilis in one video. The points that I would not be covering is particularly the, the diagnosis part because I want to make a separate video discussing the diagnosis, uh, VDRL, RPR, TPHA, all kinds of tests, uh, and what all are the what what is the principle behind them, uh, what are the false positive, false negative. So I would like to co to cover those in uh, a detailed video because I received a lot of comments regarding can you clarify some doubts. So it's better to discuss them in detail. But coming back to primary syphilis, in this video we'll be discussing the primary stage or the early infectious stage of syphilis. And syphilis is important to understand because it's like a leprosy of the STI world. Okay, with its protein manifestations and any kind, uh, any kind of uh, clinical appearance, you might. Uh, it's very easy to miss syphilis. Okay. So we need to know what are the what is the most important or what is the most common presentations, and so that we can keep it in mind that we might be dealing with a patient with syphilis. And since the treatment of syphilis is actually uh, easy and nearly hundred percent cure rates are there with penicillin, we must make sure that we do not miss syphilis because each and every patient that we miss might eventually lead to a case of congenital syphilis or tertiary syphilis with its own complications. So it's very important as a venereologist that we should know about primary syphilis and in this video we'll be discussing it quickly and in detail. So this uh, will be a bit longer video but don't worry, uh, each and every aspect of primary syphilis will be discussed. Let's move forward. So, syphilis is caused by a spirochete bacterium. Okay, it's a spirochete like a corkscrew. The name is Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. Okay, so Treponema genus, genus, this is species and this is subspecies name. So, this is the complete name of the organism, Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum. It is a systemic infection from the outset. What do we mean by that? It means that in case of primary syphilis, if you have a chancre localized at the uh, penile shaft or the coronal sulcus, the disease is not limited to the ulcer. Okay, It has already started to affect the neighboring draining lymph nodes. It has already started uh, spreading inside the blood circulatory system. So it, it, it is a systemic infection from the outset. That is why you don't have any topical treatment of syphilis, isn't it? It's not a, even if you if you see a single chancre, you don't give any cream to treat syphilis topically. You have to give a systemic treatment in the form of intramuscular penicillin, isn't it? So it is a systemic infection from the outset. It has florid manifestations and can in fact remain completely asymptomatic in its latent period. Now what happens is, if we just uh, discuss the, uh, you could say a life cycle of syphilis, you have the manifestation in the case of primary, you might have the rash of secondary, and then it goes in, in a latent period, and then it may present as tertiary syphilis. However, uh, nowadays the tertiary stage is not that common because of good treatment with penicillin, and uh, good public health measures that we are able to recognize and uh, screen and treat syphilis very early. So usually we see in primary and secondary stage, tertiary stage is limited. It has varied presentation, it can present as varied. It already has three stages and each of those stages can present uh, different uh, differently morphologically, okay? So more or less it is divided into two parts, infectious or early syphilis or non-infectious or late syphilis. So the primary is early, while secondary and tertiary is late syphilis. Okay, so it is infective in the early part, uh, primary stage. It is also infected till the secondary stage is reached. It can still remain infected in the secondary stage, but as it goes into its latent period, it becomes non-infectious. The transmission rate, at least through sexual route, is uh, not there. 
it is only transmitted through sexual route while uh, while it is in the primary stage where good exchange of body fluids can easily happen through the uh, affected mucosal ulcer now history nichols was responsible for isolating the bacteria in 1912 from the spinal fluid of a patient with neurosyphilis okay pen isolated it from a shanker so it was first isolated in 1912 from neurosyphilis patient from the spinal fluid of that patient but pen in 1982 was responsible of isolating it from the shanker itself so nichols was a, the the strain that nichols isolated was maintained in rabbit testicles for experiment see syphilis cannot be grown in a culture media you need a mammalian cell line you need a living cell line so that you can propagate syphilis for experiments in this case you use, use rabbit testicles to propagate spirochetes and that strain is known as nichols strain which is the first strain ever and we use it for experiments in fact most of the tests that use antigens are derived from nichols strain okay the strain isolated by pen in 1982 was also cultivated in rabbit testicles but it is less virulent than nichols okay so now we remember what is nichols strain nichols strain is the first strain of uh, syphilis isolated from a spinal fluid of neurosyphilitic patient it is meant sorry it is maintained in rabbit testicles for experiments for epidemiology the prevalence varies from 0.2 to 10.5 but remember that these are older data we don't have proper newer data like in every other stis and the prevalence is increasing because of concomitant retropositivity msm and drug abuse so if we just plot the epidemiology of syphilis it goes something like this okay so initially it was significantly high before the advent of penicillin the moment penicillin was given the prevalence drastically reduced but near 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 at about 70s to 80s when there was the hiv epidemic there was increase in cases of syphilis and it is somewhat increasing and finding a uh, uh, epidemic sort of not epidemic but some some sort of an endemic uh, spikes in prevalence because of the concomitant increase in retroviral infection msm exposure drug abuse and subsequent lack of public health measures and counseling so let's discuss a bit about the agent which causes syphilis it is caused by treponema pallidum pallidum it causes syphilis the other organisms in the same species but different subspecies are treponema pallidum pertune which causes yaws treponema pallidum endemicum which causes endemic syphilis also known as brigel and in africa it is known as sahel so this could be a good quiz question okay so endemic syphilis brigel or sahel is caused by treponema pallidum endemicum treponema pallidum keratium causes pinta and i hope i am pronouncing these names correctly if i am not just let me know in the comments okay so this is these are the four different subspecies of treponema pallidum and syphilis is caused by pallidum pallidum so we'll concentrate on this organism okay so these organisms can be differentiated by genetic methods only so remember that that these can show positive vdrl tph and other test okay they can easily have the same manifestation there's only subtle differences in the manifestation and yaws and pinta are practically extinct are not extinct but eradicated so you uh, you might not see even a single case in your entire lifetime but syphilis is very common so make sure we focus on that the last three which is yaws bigel and pinta are known as endemic trypanomatosis a group which consists of of uh, trypanoma pallidum pertune endemicum and keratium these three together are known as endemic trypanomatosis okay and out of this the yaws and bigel are the invasive one while pinta is somewhat localized invasive means that it affects the underlying tissues it affects the underlying bone subcutaneous fascia muscles you know soft tissues while pinta sticks to the skin and just subcutis while the yaws and bigel are actually very invasive okay let's move forward so this pyrochet treponema pallidum pallidum is a thin delicate pale motile regularly close coiled spiral spirochete 
with tapering ends. So too many words. I can realize that it's too many words. Just remember that it is a thin, delicate, motile spiral with tapering ends. Okay. So it's a thin, delicate, motile spiral with tapering ends. You can see here, you can see this corkscrew like appearance. This is spirochete. It is so thin that light microscopy is not used to visualize the organism. It is so small, so thin that light actually uh, diffracts around it and reaches the eye and the organism is essentially invisible to the naked eye. So to visualize the organism, we use what is known as dark brown illumination. Now, I'm not covering DGI uh, very um, in detail. We might discuss them in the diagnosis video. But what essentially happens is that the background, okay, if this is the field of vision, the background is completely black. That is why it is dark ground illumination. The ground or the background or the field is completely darkened. It is condensed. The light coming from the background is totally removed. The principle we'll discuss in the diagnosis video, okay? And in between, you see shiny, shiny spirochete. I hope it is visible. So, shiny spirochetes. Okay. So, these coil structures are seen when the background light is removed. And that is why it is known as dark ground illumination. The ground is dark and the organism is specially illuminated. I have a photograph showing that. So, we will discuss that again then. Okay. So, this is a schematic representation of the spirochete, trypanema, pallidum, subspecies pallidum. So, we can see that it's a corkscrew shaped organism with endoflagella at both ends. So, these are the dimensions of the organism 8 to 16 micrometer is the length. The width is about 0.1 to 15 micrometer. The distance between each spiral is about 0.9 micrometer. There are about 8 to 20 spirals in the entire organism. And this is a nose piece portion, which is roughly about 50 to 60 nanometers. And then these are the endoflagellae, which is responsible for the motility and the movement or the locomotion of the organism. Okay. Now, this organism is actually not that. Uh, good in synthesizing ATP. It lacks the essential proteins for iron transfer, some nucleotides, most amino acid. It's a very lacking organism. So it essentially depends on the host organisms to re to replenish its ATPs and all the uh, all the proteins which are responsible for the uh, metabolism of the organism. So that is why the spirochete loves to live inside the body because it is not able to synthesize all these energy molecules and it stays inside the body for quite long because of this. Okay, so this is the schematic diagram. So if you have a question on syphilis, it's a good idea to make a quick diagram, make a good spiral and label it. So you'll easily be able to understand, the at least the examiner will be able to understand that you're talking about spirochete. You know something about spirochete. So this is a video taken from a dark ground illumination microscopy and this is the reference if you want to see the whole video it's I think 3-4 minutes long so uh, you'll be able to see this uh, look, look at look at how bright this is and this is DGI okay this is DGI dark ground illumination microscopy so look at the background feel it's completely dark but the light which just is the light rays which are only incident on the treponin is the one which are reaching our eyes and because of that we see only the illuminated organism so it is dark ground illumination okay so you can see this hypermotile organism and there are multiple movements uh, which are which have been described and there are technically six movements so it is it's a good viva question okay it's a good viva question so the movements are slow forward that means it goes forward slow backward it goes backward Rotating on its long axis like a corkscrew, so it goes like this. Compression, it means the spring, the spring becomes condensed. Expansion, that means the spring will become. Added. And flexion, flexion means that if it's like a spring, 
it's going to bend at some place so these are the six movements which have been described and it's a good viva question uh, at least i have been asked in my residency what all movements do we see in triconema so that is how it is supposed to be described the six different types of movements of syphilis let's move forward <laughs> now uh, as i've said that this organism is not grown in culture you require mammalian cell lines okay so in vivo cultures is not that possible it is not cultivable bacterium sorry my mistake in vitro culture is not possible so it is not cultivable outside the human body you require mammalian tissue culture cells so we have read about rabbit testes isn't it same like armadillo foot for leprosy? That's why I said syphilis is like leprosy of STIs. So you use rapid testes. It requires oxygen to grow. And we have already discussed that there are many pathogens, sorry, there are many pathways that are absent in the organism. And because of that, the organism, the spirochete, is very much dependent on the mammalian cell lines, mammalian cells, human body to synthesize all these chemicals and that is why uh, it is very uh, for the survival of the organism it is very important that it stays inside the body and and since we have already said that syphilis is a systemic disease at the outset uh, we have to treat it with a systemic agent topical agent will not work okay so syphilis pyrochate dies when it is exposed to 41.5 degrees celsius for about an hour and that is lethal. It will kill the spirochete. That is why in history, we use malaria therapy. Now, what is malaria therapy? It's a very good um, anecdote in history. So, it, uh, if you have time, go and read about it. The thing is, was it was uh, uh, people with syphilis were given falciparum malaria, uh, you know, deliberately so that they develop fever. And that rise in temperature used to kill syphilis. Okay. So, that is malaria therapy. The other is catering hypertherm. Catering hypertherm. So this is the catering hypertherm that I've shown in the in the photo. It's like a it's like a heater. Okay, a room which circulates heated hair. So here you can see these are heating coils, screens, uh, coils which are circulating the heated air around. So the the principle was that it will heat the body and essentially kill spirochetes because of rising temperature. Okay, so rising temperature can kill the organism. That is why uh, malaria therapy and catering hypertherm were used previously. So we have discussed a little bit about history of treponema, uh, treponema pallidum, and we have discussed about the agent, the structure, wavelength, amplitude, and everything. Okay, flagella, no piece, all sorts of things. Now let's discuss immunology. Now, why do we have to discuss immunology? Because it is the immune complex mediated damage or the immune mediated damage that is responsible for the uh, protein manifestations in syphilis. For example, in, um, in the secondary syphilis rash, it's because of that. or it's be And the lymphadenopathy is because of that. The chancre, the ulcer which is caused is because of immune mediated damage at this level of mucosa. So, we need to know what is the immunology of leprosy. One important aspect is known as Shankar immunity. Now, what do we mean by Shankar immunity? Shankar immunity means that new lesion cannot be grown soon after the first. That means if you have a patient who has developed primary Shankar which has healed, even if you inoculate it deliberately with a syphilitic organism, a second Shankar will not form, at least for some time. And as the duration increases from the healing of primary chancre, the probability of developing a second chancre also increases with inoculation. Okay. So, for example, if a patient has a chancre, it gets healed, you inoculate, it will not develop chancre again, at least for some time, and then slowly, slowly the immunity wanes off. But this was mostly this was mostly seen in animal studies. In human studies, it was not that uh, predominantly seen. And there have been reports that uh, primary chancre along with another primary chancre was inoculated in humans also. Okay. So, uh, this is chancre immunity. If you do not treat syphilis, it leads to a lifelong chronic infection. That is why it is very important for us to recognize and treat syphilis. Because if, if it remains untreated, it's going to lead, uh, uh, lead, lead to a chronic infection and that is very detrimental to the patient's health. So it leads to a lifelong chronic infection in the absence of appropriate treatment. And why and how is syphilis able to survive for that long? 
it has a plasma factor that depresses phytohemagglutinin in lymphocyte stimulation in other words it has factors that decreases the sensitization and stimulation of lymphocytes antigen antibody immune complexes also suppresses delayed hypersensitivity reactions so whenever there is a delayed hypersensitivity reactions that is also suppressed by syphilitic proteins it has a poorly exposed immunogenic surface proteins that means that if this is the spirochete the spirochete outer membrane protein or the uh, outer membrane protein has a lot of antigens that can cause your body to form antibodies and these antibody can further limit the organism decrease the organism keep it under control but these antigens are actually hidden okay hidden by okay. so, so these are hidden by a layer of uh, periplasmic membrane which kind of uh, kind of uh, hides these uh, antigens from the immune system and when immune system is not exposed to these antigens the, the antibodies are not formed okay so that is how the organism is able to survive along with that the antigens also keep on varying so antigen variation is also there okay so let me remove this mark so that it becomes cleaner okay so the resultant tissue damage and now this is what what is this resultant it's a battle between your immune system immune system and syphilis so immune system is not able to clear syphilis properly okay uh, one one uh, in primary syphilis the ulcer may heal on its own but remember that syphilis is a chronic infection from the outset so even if the ulcer heals the chances of a chronic secondary syphilis is still present okay so remember that you have to treat it with a systemic agent so even if the ulcer heals it doesn't mean that the syphilis part is over and this ulcer is because the immune system is very strongly trying to limit the infection releasing all the chemokines cytokines and all the reactive oxygen species to, to destroy the spirochete and in turn is also destroying the surrounding cells forming a ulcer the primary syphilis immune reaction is cd4 mediated which gradually shifts to cd8 mediated in the secondary syphilis the the macrophages which are activated and the b cells which are subsequently activated because of immune system leads to the antibody formation and when those antibodies are formed they are going to you know they going to start the humoral response the humoral response which will further lead to damage so remember that in syphilis cell mediated immunity and humoral mediated immunity both is responsible for excessive tissue damage causing the ulcer the lymphadenopathy and all sorts of other manifestations so isn't it isn't it similar like leprosy pathology id50 is 57 organism that means minimum organism required to cause a disease in 50% of population that's infective dose 50 or id50 organisms appear within minutes in lymph node in blood in about hours they penetrate through small breaks in the skin of mucosa so during sexual exposure if there are uh, any small breaks in the mucosa the spirochete will enter through it and use its attachment ligands to further penetrate inside the skin and affect the surrounding skin it can also stimulate host human fibroblasts which will then secrete interstitial collagenase and what do we mean by collagenase means the collagen present in the dermis will be degraded and that is how the degradation happens and ulcer formation happens the organism will then multiply in the dermis causing and eventually morphologically it will form a raised firm erythematous and painless ulcer okay this ulcer is painless indurated ulcer so as i said in the last slide humoral and cell mediated immune response eventually after after the damage is controlled leads to healing okay so it starts as the uh, this spirochete enters multiplies causes damage releases collagenase forms an ulcer ulcer is formed immune system comes immune, immune system tries to control this spirochete a, a long battle starts happening surrounding area is also destroyed ulcer is still present there gradually gradually the immune system wins somewhat 
because this pyrochid is, is now learning to infect the entire body and the immune system gradually leads to healing and here we mean healing of shankar not healing of syphilis the shankar heals but remember untreated syphilis will lead to a chronic infection okay so we have to treat the primary shankar irrespective of the immunity is helping or not Healing of primary chancre will not prevent secondary stage. So even if the chancre heals, it doesn't mean the secondary syphilis can never happen. Okay. Hmm. Transmission. So you have a, a female and a male. If the female is effect is infected, it has a, a, a she has a chancre which is somewhat hidden and not seen. Let's say so during sexual exposure, there is about twenty percent chance of infecting the male. And if the male is infected, it's about 30% chance of infecting the female. Okay. There are a few terms that we have to know. One is syphilis brephotrophica or Lewis insontium. That is when a health caregiver develops syphilis while handling patients with syphilis uh, or babies with syphilis or children with syphilis. And it is a non-sexual transmission. So syphilis brephotrophica is actually a type of fomite not exactly formite, but touch transmission via touch. Now, see if the, the ulcers are teeming with spirochetes. If I have a break in my finger and I touch the ulcer, the spirochete can enter my finger and form a chancre on, on the fingertip, isn't it? But this is a non sexual transmission, and that is known as syphilis brephotrophica, seen usually in healthcare workers who deal with treatment of syphilitic patients. Syphilis de omblet. Technically, it should be like this. Syphilis de omblet is when the, the treponema spirochetes are transfused via blood. Let's say person A has syphilis, multiple treponemes in the blood, donates blood. That blood is transfused to person B. Person B has direct hematogenous transmission of syphilis. So, the ulcer will not be there. The ulcer will not form and there will be direct transmission to the secondary stage. There will be no primary stage. So, in syphilis de we will directly see the skin rash. We will not see a history. We will not have a history of primary chancre. And syphilis can remain alive in blood for about 4 degrees Celsius for at least 2 to 3 days. That is why whenever you donate blood, it is always screened for syphilis. Okay. Breastfeeding transmission is only possible if the lesion is present on the nipple. Direct transmission. And there have been uh, enough case reports about oral chancres occurring because of breastfeeding. So, that is there. <clears throat> the incubation period of syphilis depends on the inoculum size. Larger the inoculum size, the uh, shorter the period. One third of the patients will give a history of primary chancre. Otherwise, it might go unnoticed. Remember, primary chancre can heal by itself. Okay. So, it is, it is uh, very important that we ask for history of a primary chancre because they might not have noticed it and it might have healed. Especially in females where the primary chancre can exist on cervix and they might never know that they have syphilis. Uh, and they directly land up in pregnancy with a positive TPHA. So, in vivo, the incubation period is about 31 days. So, incubation period is 31 days. In vitro, it is 25 days. But the answer that you have to give is 9 to 90 days with a mean of 3 to 4 weeks. Okay, these are, these are the one which is mentioned in textbooks. So, it can range from 9 to 90 days depending upon inoculum size. But the mean is 3 to 4 weeks. Secondary incubation period means when you have infection and either it skips the primary uh, syphilis or it develops, heals and directly presents as a secondary syphilis rash. So that is secondary incubation period. So let me explain it like this. You have primary, sorry, primary chancre here and you have secondary rash here. So secondary rash, primary chancre. This is incubation period. This is secondary incubation period. Okay, this is mean 3 to 4 weeks, this is 8 weeks, but it is always less than 6 months. Always less than 6 months. Okay, let's move forward. Let's discuss about chancre now. So, chancre starts initially as a red macule because of inflammation, gradually becomes a papule, then a pustule which ruptures to form an ulcer. It's a single painless, non tender. Raised, indurated, firm, erythematous ulcer. Now, this definition is important. This is a definition of a Hunterian chancre. Let me write it again. Hunterian 
shanker which is the other name for primary syphilis single painless non tender raised indurated firm erythematous ulcer with rolled borders and ham colored smooth base these are just descriptive terms the first line is enough okay so it's somewhat like you could say like this okay Roughly size range from 3 mm to 3 cm. It heals within 12 days. May persist in one third of females and half of males. It may persist. One fourth of the cases may be painful. Because of the resulting damage and inflammation at the site, it might be painful. Along with that, secondary infection by other bacterium can result in a painful chancre. But remember, painful chancre is seen in the chancroid and all. Okay. So this is a black and white photo again. I don't want YouTube to blacklist me. Otherwise, I'll have to remove this photograph. So this is a shanker. You can see at the level of uh, the prepuce, you see the rolled rolled margins. Uh, okay, rolled raised margin, and this is the ulcer flow, ham colored flow. Okay, there are multiple photos available in your textbooks. You can always refer, but YouTube guidelines doesn't allow me to post this kind of clinical picture, so that will be an issue. Let's move forward. So the next is Doriflop sign. So this is a good Viva question. I have been asked in my Viva what is Doriflop sign. Now remember that chancre and chancre of syphilis is indurated. It is hard. It is firm. So when you retract the prepuce, it is like a very hard swelling. Okay. So if let's let's say if this is the uh, if this is a penis and you're retracting the prepuce because of the endurated shankar, you will not be able to retract it easily. And when you put a little bit force, this entire thing, if, if you can see it in the camera, this entire thing will go up and it will flop, flop in, in its place. Okay. So if you are removing, removing, clip, and that is what is known as Dory flop sign. Okay. So if I can, I, I think I may attempt to draw. So if you have a shanker, let's say here, and you are retracting the prepuce, the shanker is going to become upright like this. Okay, Th this is the prepuce. And when you move it forward, this movement will flop. In other words, very sudden rapid jerky movement. And that is known as Dory flop sign. I know it is difficult to imagine in the absence of uh, photographs, but trust me, if you see me in any conference, just ask me to explain Dolly Flop sign uh, a bit, bit uh, in a bit easier manner rather than a 2D video. Okay, so it's a flop of prepuce due to shanker inside. The male sites are more com most commonly coronal sulcus, glands, shaft, prepuce, frenulum, meatus. Female, it is mostly seen in vulva, vagina, cervix. Extra genital manifestation is seen in about 12 to 14 percent. Usually, it is the oral cavity, okay, and e even hands. Okay, these all areas have been involved. Lymphadenopathy is seen in about 50 percent of the cases. It is painful. It resolves in four to six weeks. And lymphadenopathy has these spirochetes. So you can use a lymph node aspiration to culture spirochetes. Okay, let's move forward. Now these are the chancre variants. For example, condom chancre occurs on the shaft of penis. Usually chancre is seen nearly at about the coronal sulcus. But since if you are using a condom, the whole shaft is protected and only the exposed part. Okay, if if only the exposed part is uh, is like this. Okay. So, shanker will occur here only, where it is exposed. So, that is known as a condom shanker. Monorecidive or shanker redux means recurrence of primary shanker at the site of a previous healed shanker. So, it has to heal. Primary shanker occurs, it heals. At the same site, another shanker develops. Re reoccurrence of a primary shanker. Pseudo shanker redux means non infectious granulomatous lesion of late syphilis occurring at the site of a healed primary shanker. Okay, so you have a primary shanker. If it heals and another primary develop, that is Shankar redux. If it heals and a secondary rash gametous lesion develop, then it is pseudo Shankar redux. Okay. And it is non infectious. Remember, Shankar is infectious, but pseudo Shankar redux is non infectious. Syphilitic melanitis of Fallman. Syphilitic superficial melanitis occurring after, before, with, without Shankar. The inflammation of the glands area 
superficially, it is not deep, doesn't form an ulcer. That is known as syphilitic balanitis of Fallman. Kissing ulcer or chancre is an adjacent due to adjacent ulcer due to auto inoculation. So if uh, not like this. So uh, I can explain it here only. You have a chancre here and a chancre here. Okay, this happened because these two are in close proximity and attached to each other. That is why it's causing an chancre. Sometimes when the prepuce goes over the primary chancre, the surface of the prepuce which is in attachment to the primary chancre can get infected from another primary chancre and these two are on the opposing faces. So that is how it is known as kissing chancre. The complications include edema, phimosis, erosive balanitis. Again, I can write fall men. Lymphangitis, thrombophlebitis or the dorsal vein of penis. Phagogenic ulcer. Now, what is phagogenic? Phage means to eat. So, it is an eating ulcer. Like bacteriophage, bacterial eating virus. So, phagogenic ulcer or chancre is when the chancre is super infected by fusobacterium species. And because of this secondary super infection, you have significant necrosis, gangrene and extensive tissue destruction. That is why it is known as phagogenic ulcer. Clear? Let's move on. HIV and syphilis. So whenever we are discussing HIV in the background of any other STI or if we, if we are discussing any STI in the background of HIV, you have to discuss it like this. So you have syphilis and HIV. If, if a patient of syphilis is there, what are the chances of developing HIV? So because it's an ulcer disease, it's a genital ulcer disease, it opens up the mucosa, it breaks the mucosal barrier and it can get easily infected via HIV because now the virus can easily enter the body. So the transmission rate can increase four times. Okay. It can also increase the serology or the uh, development of, you know, uh, antibodies to HIV, antigens to HIV. The multiplication of HIV can also increase. And delayed decrease of viral load with treatment. So if the person with syphilis contracts HIV and you give treatment, the uh, the uh, you could say the progression or the regression of HIV viral load is slower if the person has syphilis before that. Okay. Now what does HIV do for syphilis? It increases the transmission by about 10 percent. Sorry, 10 times. 10 times. It increases the transmission by 10 times. It also delays the normalcy of serology. So remember that syphilis has VDRL, TPH positive. You give treatment, VDRL should come to be negative in three to six months. This delays the, the normalcy of serology when the patient already has HIV and inf gets infected by syphilis. You can have multiple atypical features, slow healing of ulcers. Ulcer can be large, painful, multiple. Increased progression to neurosyphilis. This is important. Increased chances of asymptomatic neurosyphilis. Okay. And Lewis maligna. What is Lewis maligna? It is malignant syphilis. We'll discuss malignant syphilis when I will be discussing prime, uh, secondary and tertiary syphilis. Okay. But this is what Lewis, Lewis maligna means. Lewis, uh, Lewis is syphilis. I hope my spelling is correct, but Lewis is older name for syphilis. Phew. So we have discussed about primary chancre. Let's say a patient comes with primary chancre with you. Uh, how will you diagnose? So diagnosis again for any STI has to go through these uh, parameters. You have direct identification and you use dark field microscopy like uh, this is DGI that we have discussed. Direct fluorescent antibody, PCR. But if you can, you may have to biopsy the ulcer in order to, let's say, rule out from any SEC malignancy, differentiate from chancroid and all. Electron microscopy for research purposes. So these are there when you have to directly see the spiral case. Then we have serological test, which includes, which are going to two parts, treponema specific test and non treponema test. I will not be going into detail. I'll discuss them in a separate video on diagnosis. Third, we have point of care test, which includes multiplex PCR, that is for chancroid, Chancroid, syphilis, and herpes simplex ulcer. And if you have a quadriplex PCR, you also have donovanosis. Donovanosis. SD bioline and safety check are, are names of few of the point of care tests. 
but we don't use them. We eventually uh, go for DGI and other immunoscopes uh, for direct directly looking at the spirochete. Now, dark field microscopy. I'm not going to discuss. I'm going to detail. We'll just go very quickly on the diagnostic aspects. Now, a sample taken is from an ulcer ooze. You are supposed to actually compress the ulcer with your fingers and thumb so that some serous fluid comes from the base. And you then put a glass slide on top of the ulcer. Take the glass slide out. Stain it. Either uh, to look for DGA. Okay. You can either take the ulcer ooze or lymph node aspirate. If the uh, lymph node is fluctuant, just aspirate. Or you can inject normal saline, massage the lymph node and then aspirate. You may even take amniotic fluid but that is used for congenital syphilis. Not for oral lesion because in oral cavities, some other spirochetes are present which are part of normal bacterial flora. And remember that DGI or dark field microscopy cannot differentiate among different treponemes. DGI will only show you a, a spirochete. Whether that spirochete is Trypanoma pallidum pallidum, you don't know. So if you take it from oral cavity, you will see normal spirochetes and you will think it is syphilis. Okay, So it is not for oral lesions. So this is one. Uh, this uh, this is the picture that you see in DGI. The whole ba background is black. It is dark, and you just see one shiny, bright uh, corkscrew-shaped syphilis treponema or spirochete. We don't know what it is. Spirochete. Okay, this is how you see in a dark brown microscopy. Direct fluorescent antibody for treponema pallidum. It is nothing special. It is more sensitive and specific can be used for oral lesions because in this you are using antibodies directed against the treponema pallidum. Okay, so since the antibodies are against treponema pallidum, it can be used for syphilis, yaws, vigil, pinta. So all four will be seen properly. And if you want to see only syphilis, then you have to add the treponema pallidum pallidum antigen. So what happens is you just label the organism with the antigen uh, antigen, and because of this antigen you then conjugate this antigen with fluorescent antibodies and because the antibodies are fluorescent they will glow. Okay. So look at this picture again you can see this glowing glowing spirochete that is because the antigen specific fluorescent labeled antibodies have been directed against the spirochetes. Biopsy. So, if you uh, for a for proper diagnosis, you need to look at this the spirochete. Okay. Now, uh, you may have to biopsy a chancre when you want to uh, differentiate between, uh, let's say, any other causal genital ulcers, SCC. Okay, these kind of things. So, in biopsy, you see vascular endothelial cell proliferation. You see obliteration of vascular lumen. So, this kind of uh, thrombo, thrombitis, thrombitis kind of uh, lesions are uh, developing. Important things are that there is a pandermal infiltrate consisting of macrophages, lymphocytes and plasma cells. Now plasma cells are important. Syphilis is one of the differentials of a pandermal plasma cell rich infiltrate. So you have a pandermal infiltrate. So remember whenever you see a biopsy from an ulcer which is filled from top to bottom with plasma cell rich inflammatory infiltrate, consider syphilis. Other stains that have been used are Warden Silver Starry. That is a very important question in Viva. What all stains can be used? Warden Silver Starry, Levadity. Okay. And uh, it's a TH1 response that is, I think, just out of W. But remember, you have a pandermal plasma cell rich infiltrate in the biopsy from the syphilitic shank. So, this is a 4X magnification you could roughly you can say a uh, oh, lower lower magnification and look at this look at this let me change the color what color would work huh. even this is not working yeah this will work look at the ulcer you see this is the ulcer and look at the pandermal infiltrate we don't know what the infiltrate is made up of at this magnification but look at the pandermal infiltrate with an ulcer and if this infiltrate is rich in plasma cells consider syphilitic ulcer and this is on greater magnification you can see the involvement of blood vessels uh, fib fibrin uh, vertical cast uh, obliteration of vessel lumen and these are all in between rich 
cellular rich infiltrate and if you go deeper you might be able to look at all the plasma cells here here these are these are lymphocytes lymphocyte lymphocyte nee no, this one is a plasma cell this is a lymphocyte of course with experience you'll be able to find out now this is a looks like looks like a neutrophil lymphocyte so a pandermal infiltrate consisting of lymphocyte macrophages and plasma cells along with obliteration of a vessel volume and is seen in cephalitic chancre let's move forward maybe we will discuss histopathology when in the future we might go into dermatopathology then it becomes sense to understand the uh, individual cells now this picture i have just included just to show how uh, this spider kit looks under electron microscope this is how it looks under an electron microscope this kind of a corkscrew shape appearance let me just change the color now corkscrew change appearance under electron microscopy but it is only used for research purposes now polymeric chain reaction can differentiate among different repellents why remember in the second slide i told you that they are different genetically repellents are different genetically that means your spinta vigil syphilis can be differentiated on the basis of genetic uh, genetics and polymerase chain reaction utilizes the nuclear acid isn't it it, it utilizes uh, the nucleic acid of the organism and since you have a pcr specific to syphilis you can easily differentiate it with from the endemic treponemes okay so multiplex pcr we have already discussed hsv12 h duke and syphilis and if you have donovanosis then that is known as quadruplex cbr donovanosis then quadruplex pcr Let's move on. Now, treponemal test, non-treponemal test. We are we are just going to touch up on it. I will not go into details. We'll discuss them. We'll discuss the proson phenomena on a separate video on diagnosis. It's a very difficult topic for understand. I repeatedly get questions that uh, we have a patient of pregnancy who has one is to four titers of VDR, and how should we interpret it? uh all these questions will be answered in the separate video but we'll just go through the treponemal test in primary syphilis okay so the treponemal test they they look for fragments or whole organisms and they become positive before the non treponemal test and when they are positive they will remain positive for life long okay because it is specific to treponemes Enzyme immunoassay is the first test to become positive, and it is positive in about three weeks after inoculation. The FTA antibodies utilize serums with FITC labeled anti-human IgG antibodies. So this is somewhat like a uh, fluorescent test, and you see the glowing organisms in this also. But here you are not labeling the organism; you are just labeling the anti uh, antibodies present there. Okay. TP particle agglutination. This was older test. TP PA. It is older test. Nowadays we use TP HA. Treponema pallidum particle hemagglutination, in which the agglutination of RBCs is taken as positive or negative. Okay. If if instead of agglutination you are looking at fluorescent, then then it becomes FT ABS. Microhemagglutination is. Uh, different we have just mentioned it enzyme immunoassay igm is for active disease and in neonates it can be used to diagnose congenital syphilis why because igg antibodies are not passed after 6 months to the uh, through the placenta okay so uh, it, this enzyme immunoassay igm type can be used to diagnose active disease because we know that igm is increased in the active phase and igg in the chronic phase so igm can be used So for the TP test, we use ultrasonicated material from nickel strain. Remember nickel strain, the initial strain maintained in rabbit tests for experiments. These are the experiments we are talking about. So this diagram somewhat shows you uh, what is the principle be be uh, behind the TP test. You have avine RBCs, that means RBCs from birds, which are coated with Treponema pallidum antigens. In this, you add patient serum. 
and the serum has IgM and or IgG specific antibodies and this antibodies when it attaches itself to RBC the RBCs will clump together and agglutinate okay agglutination in micro titration plate and that is what we call as positive TPHA or reactive TPHA okay so now you remember because once the antibodies are formed even if it is IgM initially subsequently it will become IgG and IgG is going to remain lifelong that is why TPHA is positive lifelong because it is looking at IgM and IgG and IgG will be present lifelong so that is why once positive TPHA will remain positive now non pneumonia test and of these we use VDRN and RPR reactive plasmid reagent the the now what happens is triponemal test look for triponemes either fragment or whole organism while non triponemal test they look at the antigens inside the body so these antigens are lecithin cardiolipin cholesterol and these are all cell membrane antigens that is why whenever there is extensive tissue destruction even in the absence of spirochetes VDRL can become false positive okay and in the cases of uh, let's say uh, autoimmune flare up of disease sorry flare up of autoimmune disease stroke pregnancy in these conditions when VDRL becomes false positive it is known as biologically sorry biological false positive so positive VDRL in absence of syphilis is biological false positive okay so in VDRL you inoculate the sample at 56 degrees celsius for about 30 minutes and it's a microscopic test that means you have to use a microscope while in RPR you have the antigen from the patient's serum you, you mix it with charcoal peptide to look at to visualize it to see it you have black colored uh, char you have, you have charcoal which, which is used to visualize see it with naked eyes so the difference between VDRL and RPR is that VDR is microscopic while RPR is macroscopic you can see it with your eyes RPR tear drop set is further refinement of RPR it has multiple fields you can easily get titles what is trust trust is toludine red untreated serum test Toludine red untreated serum test or in short trust it is also a modification of RPR in which charcoal and toludine red is used so you have black and to make it more you know visually uh, easily to recognize and ELISA can also be done against VDRL antigen if you want to use an enzyme linked immunosorbent assay so one question which can come in viva is what are the modifications of RPR so you have two modifications you have teardrop and you have trust so these are two modifications of RPR clear let's move forward Phew. so finally we have discussed all the academically important things about uh, penicillin sorry about syphilis and we'll quickly go through the treatment part the treatment part is not that difficult to understand the treatment is by a via penicillin which is the drug of choice nearly 100 percent cure rate practically no resistance have been reported so it is benzathine penicillin 1.2 million units in each buttocks intramuscularly so has to be given you give it once for early infectious and three times week one week apart in uh, secondary syphilis and tertiary syphilis other antibiotics now remember wherever you you can use penicillin use penicillin no matter what other antibiotics that have been tried are amoxicillin but there have been increasing resistance so not recommended not recommended even CDC, the recommendation via CDC is to give benzathine penicillin or any other forms of penicillin like penicillin G uh, if it is if it can be given. Okay, if it can be given, give G. If the patient is allergic, then desensitize and give penicillin. That's what CDC says. But there are uh, secondary recommendations about other antibiotics, and these are those under other antibiotics. We have azithromycin, two gram single dose. The half life is very long, but because of A2058 G mutation, the resistance is high. Now, uh, remember that penicillin is intramuscularly given. It is painful, it is difficult. The person has to come to you to take treatment. So, there has been a long research and search about oral treatment for 
uh, for syphilis. Azithromycin was supposed to be a promising drug, but nowadays, because of increasing resistance, the usage of azithromycin has been curbed in as far as syphilis is concerned. Other drug is tetracycline, namely doxycycline, which is now the hot favorite. 100 mg twice a day. Uh, this is given for around 2 weeks. 2 weeks. It has better CNS penetration but contraindicated in pregnancy. Another antibiotic is ceftriaxone, 1 gram for 10 to 14 days, intravascular or intramuscular. Half life is about 7 hours. 10 to 20 percent cross reactivity with penicillin. Okay. Now see. Uh, as we have said in the first slide that syphilis is a chronic systemic disease at its outset. That means the moment it starts, it strives to become a chronic disease. And when you have a chronic disease, you have to treat it with a systemic agent which remains in the system long enough to kill all the prevailing spirochetes. Okay. So in order to kill all the organisms, it has to stay there. And that no drug does it better than penicillin. Other drugs, other antibodies are erythromycin, 500 mg, 4 times a day for 2 weeks. It's an oral and uh, somewhat uh, e easy to use drug because it's an oral administered drug. It is used in HIV and erythromycin base is used in pregnancy. Okay, so benzene penicillin, 1.2 million units in each buttock, stat, amoxicillin not used, erythro 2 gram stat. Doxycycline 100 mg, BD for 2 weeks, ceftriaxone 1 gram for 10 to 14 days in IV, IM. Erythromycin 500 mg 4 times a day for 2 weeks. So the duration of treatment is for oral agent it is 2 weeks. For IM penicillin it is single dose. Okay. So let's discuss a bit about penicillin. I know it's this is going to be more than an hour but we will go very quickly through the treatment part. Now for penicillin any concentration more than 0 0.018 mg per liter maintained for 7 to 10 days will kill all these spirochetes in the system. This trepano means uh, trepano, no, treponemocidal. Okay, so it is treponemocidal. That means the concentration of syphilis maintained at more than 0 0.018 mg per liter for at least 7 to 10 days is enough to kill the treponemes. That is why during secondary syphilis, okay, in secondary syphilis, the organism divides very slowly. In primary syphilis or the, the division time of triponym is about 30 to 33 hours. And it becomes slower in secondary syphilis. That is why you have to repeat the doses two more times. That is why you give three IM injections one week apart. So that at every seven days you are giving another shot. Every seven days you are giving another shot. Okay. So, penicillin maintained for 7 to 10 days is treponemocidal. Drug of choice is penicillin G parenterally because it guarantees bioavailability. That means it will be uh, the oral, see, oral administration of drug does not have a good bioavailability. If you remember our series on antifungals, oral antifungals was around 57%, 77% bioavailability. But IV antifungals, okay, IV fluconazole, or for that matter, even IV biologics, I have 100% bioavailability, isn't it? So, if you give it intramuscularly, of course, intramuscularly is not that uh, efficacious if compared to intravenous, but intramuscular parenteral penicillin has good enough guaranteed bioavailability. Additionally, it has a directly observed therapy or dot. Directly observed means the doctor has actually made sure that the patient has received syphilis. In oral drug, you might not be sure that the person has gone back and take medicine. While in penicillin injection, if you are giving it via your own hand in front of you, you have practically made sure that patient has received penicillin. It has 100% cure rate in primary syphilis. Remember, penicillin in syphilis and clofazamine in leprosy. No rest, no practically no resistance have been reported. Clear? Other types of penicillin, which is benzathine penicillin, this is what CDC recommends because it is easily available. But remember, it is it suffers from long bouts of shortages. In fact, now on now also, if you go to CDC website and search for treatment of syphilis, you will find a huge disclaimer on the front page which says that benzathine penicillin is going to go short for some time and what are steps clinicians can take when they acquire a patient of syphilis but they don't have access to benzathine penicillin. 
the levels which are reached in blood are low but benzathion penicillin is treponemocidal in about 18 to 25 days if it is maintained for that there are preparation in which lidocaine is also added so that the injection is comfortable now pen penicillin injection is very uncomfortable it is very painful if you have any time injected a patient yourself you will realize how painful it is okay plus the concentration doesn't happen much in csf so it's not that good a drug for neurosyphilis we'll discuss the treatment of neurosyphilis when we'll be discussing tertiary syphilis now what to do if your patient has allergy to penicillin penicillin allergy is one of the most common drug allergies uh, that patient might come up with and say that i am allergic to penicillin now how will you treat so what are allergies can be seen in anaphylaxis can be seen and jodima can be seen basically type 1 hypersensitivity it is usually seen in 0.04% to 0.2% and 0.001% of patients can have an adverse outcome mortality is reported in about 0.001% patient because of penicillin allergy okay now what you can do you can test you do a intradermal test you inject it and see how much is the size of wheel and flare if it is more than 3 mm according to cdc more than 2 mm that means that the patient is allergic to penicillin about 67% of patients or six, what is 67 two third two third of patients may develop a reaction so you have to be very very careful you keep on observing for 20 minutes for wheel and flare to develop and in fact when you give penicillin you have to observe for at least one to two hours to look at any kind of vital abnormalities what do you do if a patient develops penicillin allergy rapid assessment and treatment treated as any other anaphylaxis or angioedema give iv adrenaline antihistamines and corticosteroid they may or may not be required may or may not depending on the severity of allergy start cpr and maintain airway in case of severe cases and anaphylaxis okay so penicillin allergy has to be treated like you would treat any kind of allergy or anaphylaxis clear let's move forward so let's say your patient has penicillin cdc recommends to desensitize the patient but still give penicillin so if the patient is allergic desensitize them but give penicillin so uh, here i will be discussing only oral method of desensitization you also have an intravenous method you can go and uh, i'll put this link uh, the put this url in the description go and read this whole article you'll be easily able to know the oral method to desensitize there are also iv level just go in it's available on pubmed so the oral level is that you have a solution of 1000 units per ml and every half an hour or so every 30 minutes you have to expose the patient to this for example 0.1 ml of 100 unit 0.2 ml 0.4 ml 0.8 1.6 3.2 6.4 you gradually keep on increasing till you reach 6.4 ml after 6.4 ml you use the next step of dilution which is 10000 units per ml and start from here okay it's a very complicated looking chart but don't worry about it you might never acquire a patient of syphilis who has penicillin allergy but if you do just i have removed all the markings just take a screenshot or go to the individual article and read you just have to prepare a stock solution of dilu these dilutions and give it an increasing amount the principle that uh, it uh, through which it works and remember for oral you have to use penicillin v suspension the principle it works means that in case of penicillin allergy if you give penicillin the patient lands in anaphylaxis or shock isn't it what you are trying to do is giving very small 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 doses of penicillin so that the patient develops small small immune reaction which eventually leads to immune exhaustion that means all the antibodies all the ige antibodies against penicillin are bound and used up and when they are used up the patient will not develop allergy for that instance that is why it is recommended that even after giving 1.3 million units you repeat the doses of 1.2 million units to uh, in each buttocks so that you are sure that you have given penicillin okay so for naco regimen naco regimen of course we have two kits we have kit 3 which is white 
and we have kit 4 which is blue in kit 1 sorry in kit 3 you have benzetin pericin 2.5 million units one while you give 1.2 1.2 in, in each and additionally azithromycin 1 gram single dose okay in kit blue or the kit 4 you have doxycycline 100 mg bd for 15 days which covers for for syphilis along with azithromycin 1 gram Mention in comments what are we treating with azithromycin 1 gram. We have covered it before. Okay. So azithromycin 1 gram is used to treat with STI. Let's move forward. This is your homework. Follow. Follow up is very essential. You have to look at the cure which is very important. You repeat serological test at about 3 months, 6 and 12 months if the titers are not reduced. Remember you have to reduce the titers by at least 4 times. That means if it was, was, if it was 1 is to 64, 1 is to 32, 1 is to 16, 1 is to uh, 8, one is to four. If it was one is to sixty four, it should come back four times to one is to eight in three months in VDL. VDL essentially should become negative. So there should be four times decline in titer, but fifteen to twenty percent of patients may not achieve this. There should be resolution of the ulcer. Look at the HIV status and immunodeficiency. Look at all the reports that you have given for other STIs like Hep B, Hep C, HIV. Uh, look look at VDRL if it has gone down by four times titers. Address all patient concerns and also treat partner. Partner treatment is very important in syphilis. We'll discuss them in one slide. Don't worry. Now, GX reaction. Very important. I have just one slide. So, JH reaction or Yarish Huxheimer reaction is a reaction in which there is systemic inflammation because of dying spirochetes. So this is because of dying spirochetes. Now what do we mean by that? There are spirochetes in the entire blood circulatory system, isn't it? You give penicillin, all the spirochetes die. When they die, they release all their organelles outside in the blood. Immune system recognizes secretes chemicals, cytokines and because of that you have this systemic manifestation known as JH reaction. So it is seen clinically as febrile illness, rigors, headache, myalgia. The rash of secondary syphilis can appear or may increase also. Now remember JH reaction can occur anytime whenever you treat syphilis. You can treat in secondary syphilis also and it can develop JH reaction then also. It is seen in within 24 hours of receiving penicillin, but mostly within 3 to 12 hours. And it is more common in primary syphilis. In about 8 to 95 percent of patients may develop GHD reaction. So it becomes very important to recognize it early so that it can be treated. So whenever uh, I have given uh, penicillin in private practice for in about uh, four or five patients, I always observe them for two hours, take vitals. And I even counsel them and give that in writing that if any untoward thing happens, they have to come to the emergency as soon as possible and contact me. Okay, uh, emergency in my hospital is open 24-7. So you are supposed to come and give me a call and I'll look at any kind of GH reaction. Fortunately, I have not seen any of those five patients developing GH. Now, what actually happens is lysis of spirochetes. The death of spirochetes releases endotoxin, and because of these endotoxin, there is increased levels of TNF alpha, interleukin 6, interleukin 8, and this leads to intense inflammation. Intense inflammation. And that is what is GH reaction. If it happens in a pregnant woman, it might precipitate early labor, fetal distress, fetal uh, heart abnormal, sorry, not heart abnormalities, fetal tachycardia, the fetal heart sounds may be raised. But even if the patient is pregnant and you might suspect GH reaction, that does not mean that you will not give treatment. You have to treat the patient. Remember, CDC says if you can desensitize, desensitize and give penicillin in a pregnant lady, that is much better than opting for erythromycin or azithromycin. Okay? Desensitize, give penicillin. Even if you suspect that JH reaction can happen, give it in observation, observe for 24 hours, but give penicillin. 
ट्रीटमेंट इज दैट यू हैव टू वॉर्न अबाउट द पॉसिबिलिटी लेट देम नो दैट दिस काइंड ऑफ थिंग कैन हैपन बट डू नॉट वरी कम टू द इमरजेंसी गिव एंटीपायरेटिक्स हाइड्रेशन स्मॉल डोजेज ऑफ ग्लूकोकॉर्टिकॉर्स लाइक अबाउट टेन टू ट्वेल्व मिलीग्राम प्रेगनेसलोन माइट बी रिक्वायर्ड टू टेक केयर ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ इन्फ्लेमेटरी रिएक्शन there are reports of usage of tnf alpha inhibitors but the evidence is lagging so we'll not go against it one important viva question regarding gh reaction and this reaction i think i have discussed when i was teaching post graduates at aims rishikesh okay so this is a very good viva question gh reaction can be seen in all spiro Kid infections, which includes syphilis, Lyme disease, relapsing fever, and leptospirosis. Additionally, it can be seen in Q fever, Bartonella infection, or Bartonellosis. brucellosis now these are organisms that we have never heard of isn't it brucellosis and african tri african trypanosoma trypanosomiasis i think i'll write it again <laughs> african Trypano, so myasis. Now these are the uh, the clinical conditions in which you can see a reaction similar to JH reaction or Yarish and Semmel reaction. So uh, if you are treating a patient of Lyme disease, make uh, remember that JH reaction can occur there also. Now in pregnancy. The drug of choice is benzathione penicillin, 1.2 milliliters in each buttocks intramuscularly. Even if you have to desensitize, desensitize, but try to give penicillin. Additional drugs are azithromycin, same doses, ceftriaxone, and erythromycin base form. Base form. Okay, let's move on. Now partner treatment. Partner treatment as per CDC. Treat all partners. Who have been sexually exposed with the index patient within the last 90 days plus duration? What do we mean by that? Let's see. This is the timeline. This is the time the patient has presented to you. This is the time when patient has developed a chancre. Okay. So this is the duration. Clear? Duration plus 90 days before the onset of action. Okay, onset of chancre. So this is the timeline. All exposures within this has to be treated. All exposure within this treat. Clear treat. If the exposure is above ninety days plus duration. you have to do test you have to test the, all your partners if the test is positive or are there any clinical symptom treat as a patient of syphilis not partner of a patient patient of syphilis if the test is negative no treatment just keep under follow up if the test is not available or the follow up is uncertain treat always remember in case of syphilis when in doubt treat no harm is going to come from giving intramuscular penicillin shots but harm will come if penis if syphilis is missed okay so when in doubt treat in areas of high intensity where the patient is may presenting with a high tryponemal titus uh, high non tryponemal titus more than 1 is to 32 you might have to treat all the sexual partners irrespective of duration of exposure because the endemicity or the prevalence rate of syphilis is very high in population or if population are very high risk population for example in, in uh, truck drivers and all um, or the people who are engaged in uh, commercial sex work you might have to treat all sexual partners so remember any exposure within 90 days plus duration treat presumptively more than 90 days per duration test them 
If test is positive, treat as per stage. If test is negative, no treatment but follow up. If test is not available, follow up is uncertain, treat. When in doubt, treat syphilis. Phew, so we have finished this very, 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 very long. I think this is my longest video yet. I have spoken non-stop for one hour, 15 minutes. Let's not increase the duration. Let's finish. Further reading, this chapter is good, but uh, I've covered most of the things in this video. You do not, you do not, you do not require anything. CDC guidelines are given here. NACO is there. This article will tell you about oral desensitization protocol, if you want to know. This will tell you about pathology, biopsy. So pathology means histopathology, biopsy in uh, stages of syphilis. So it's a good article to read. And this, if you want to learn more about how to handle penicillin allergy mechanisms principle, so this will be available in the description. Don't worry. So finally, we have finished primary shanker and I know it is very long. Again, I have really have to say it's long, but I wanted to cover primary shanker in detail because it's a base to understand secondary syphilis, tertiary syphilis and the diagnosis of syphilis. So if this is okay, we'll just go through or with a breeze and from um, while discussing the other stages of syphilis. So even I am tired because I have spoken more than an hour. So, I will not take much time. Uh, any comments are most welcome. I am receiving comments from viewers and they have been very helpful in answering. I have to go and search about different articles to answer your question. Lovely comments, lovely doubts and very, very good suggestions also. So, any doubts, just email me or you can mention them just below the video. I reply to all comments. Till then, adios. Bye-bye. We'll see you once also before in 2023. Enjoy your weekend.